there's lots of people that have strong positions on being focused or having a portfolio of things and i think it's basically bullshit you just got to do things that you're good at and enjoy see which ones work and then when it makes sense to focus then great do a period of focus hello and welcome back to indie bites the podcast where i bring you stories of fellow indie hackers in 15 minutes or less Today, I'm joined by my friend Harry Morton, who runs Lower Street Media, a podcast production agency behind some of the highest quality podcasts I listen to. Over the past six months, Harry has doubled his agency revenue from 500k to a million dollars. But this certainly wasn't an overnight success. In this episode, we talk about how Harry quit his job with no savings to start Lower Street, why the productized model failed for his agency, and a mini masterclass into making a high quality podcast. Speaking of high quality podcasts, this episode is sponsored by me. Because after producing hundreds of shows for myself and clients, I've been pouring all of my knowledge into my new course, Two Hour Podcast, which shows you how to start, grow and monetize a podcast that takes you less than two hours a week. I know lots of people who want to start a pod and reap the rewards but struggle to find the time, which is exactly why I made this course. There's three parts of this course. The first is a step-by-step video guide to podcasting, then a 90-minute tutorial where I make a show from scratch, and then finally my complete notion system for producing a show in less than two hours a week. If you want to start a podcast or just want to support me in my indie hacking journey, head to twohourpodcast.com to get the course or click the link in the show notes and you can get $10 off by using code BITES at checkout. But that's enough promo from me. Let's get into this episode. So Harry, welcome to the podcast. How are you? I'm good. How are you doing? Very good. So going back to the early days, were you doing a bunch of freelance podcast production before? And like yeah. agencies aren't a dream business. Was it always your plan just to build and grow an agency? Yeah, I guess I was very naive because I didn't know that it wasn't as sexy until I started. <laughs> but I'd always known I was going to have an agency at some point. I remember when I was a teenager, I, I was starting to learn how to build websites and I could do basic HTML and CSS and a bit of design. And I was like, well, this would be cool. I can like sell the idea of a website to somebody and then just get my mate to make it. Like, that's this is genius. Like, I don't have to do any of the work. This is great. <laughs> so that was the theory. And so I'd always figured I could do the sort of sell people on an idea and then find other people to help me make it. So I'd always known I was going to do uh, an agency. I didn't always know it was going to be a podcast agency. It took me quite a long time to figure out exactly what the business was going to be that I was going to make. I knew I wanted to start a business pretty much my entire life but as I was working in sales and marketing at the time I was listening to a lot of podcasts and trying to just figure out like what is it that I would try and create and then it was through that process that a, a light bulb slowly very slowly went off that hey why don't I combine these two things my background was in audio and music and all that kind of stuff so I had the audio side already but do you remember your first client and how, how you got them yeah, it was the Ultimate Leadership Podcast with Chris Ceballero, fantastic guy, who I got through through cold email outreach. It was just, it was, yeah, it was just me. I was working by myself. I, I, so to your question before, I never actually did work as a freelancer. I set up the company from the beginning, always with the express intention of hiring other people. But it was just me fulfilling everything at the beginning. And uh, yeah, the first sort of few clients I got was literally like cold outreaching to podcasters saying, hey, it looks like you could use some help with X, Y, or Z and slowly built up a roster of clients there. What year did you set up Lower Street? October of 2016, we incorporated the company, but I didn't start trading until April the following year. So Okay, uh, yeah. and the podcasting landscape, obviously very different back then to where right. it is now. People are a lot more aware of podcasts. They're seeing well-produced shows, business shows, and they want that for themselves. There's a lot of hobbyists starting their own podcasts. Right. How were you convincing people back then to pay for podcasts? And was it like a premium angle you were going for back then still? Not at all. No. So I was really like on the productized train. I'd listened to a lot of podcasts that that I'm sure everyone in this show listens to. And so recurring revenue was the thing I was going after from the very beginning. So it's like, cool, we're going to do productizing. We're going to have a, a sort of low priced offer and we're going to try and scale a team around that. Quickly discovered that just competing with the incumbent kind of competitors at the time on price was just like just a really bad idea. It was a wonderful place to start. It got me in and it got me, you know, my pricing was exactly the same as my competitors. So it made it very simple for someone to have a conversation with me and a conversation with my competitor, decide which one they like best and pick one. Quickly became apparent that wasn't going to be scalable. And certainly it was going to be very hard to scale a team based on that kind of pricing model if we wanted to make stuff. And like I said, I'd, I'd come with that background in audio and music. So I really cared from the beginning about doing better work. Yeah. And so, so that meant I couldn't just hire non-native 
English speaking people. I wanted people that were like that were experienced audio folks. And that meant that I'd have to charge rates that would allow me to hire those people. So it very quickly became apparent that that, that low pricing model wasn't going to last. I'm guessing in the early days with Lower Street, it was a lot of cold outreach and recommendations. I know I found out about Lower Street from one of the podcasts you produce called uh, Secret Leaders, where you were always at the end of every podcast, you got credits. Like, is that a deal you arrange with them? Or do you do that with any other podcast where in the credits, it's like produced by Lower Street? Yeah, no, we never ask because we're, we're an agency. So most clients hire us almost as a white label solution. But some of our clients offer it. And that's and that was the case with Secret Leaders, which is awesome. Uh, and then other clients like we, we work with HP on a show called Technology Untangled. And they give us a credit there as well, which has been wonderful. And actually for them, they wanted to, to do that just because it helped to add a bit of weight to the show in a way. They wanted the world to know, hey, there's a team behind this. It's not just a guy and his microphone. So you doubling your team size doubling your revenue over the past six to eight months all with a brand new baby congratulations harry how have you done it that seems like a lot to take on over the past few months yeah it's been mental it's probably happened to a lot of us during covid right it basically exploded my business so it, it initially cut it we lost 30 percent of revenue overnight in at the beginning of the pandemic that was terrifying and i did loads of panicking and we started, you know, thinking about internal podcasts and how a team's going to want to communicate using audio in this sort of pandemic. But actually, once that, that sort of first hit of people like just drawing in their purse strings happened, we then saw this explosion of demand in, in the medium in general. Suddenly, sales teams weren't going on their sales trips anymore and the conferences and events mm. scene wasn't happening. And suddenly everyone was like, well, we want to be putting this stuff out there and this is a hot space. And so we've just been really lucky to be well established when that happened. And, you know, as much as I'd like to take all the credit for being an absolute genius salesperson <laughs> and an incredible entrepreneur, I think a lot of it has been right place, right time as well. And I'm really grateful. Honestly, I think that's so much the thing with indie hackers in general, whether it's a software tool, an agency, a, a course, any anything being able to stick at it for long enough that you've been around for long enough that reputation starts to build and that luck surface area that everyone talks about suddenly starts to kick in and you're like oh here's a project i did three years ago and i've got a yeah, lead that's yeah. coming in off the back of it like you you just the only thing you can do is stick around and that that sort of stuff will start to pay off yeah um, yeah you said you're in the right place at the right time but what you don't see is those three four years of working hard cold outreach scrapping to to pay the bills i guess and get new clients in well definitely the- and yeah and that, that was the thing as well like i did a really stupid i was listening to your interview with baird hall and it sounds like he did similar sort of thing i just dove straight into it i just quit my job <laughs> I was deeply unhappy in that job. And I was like, I need to do my own thing. So then I just I just started. And I was like, well, I've got no money. My wife is luckily gainfully employed and it was a very intelligent and a woman doing her thing. So she was able to cover the bills for a bit. When you quit your job, did you have savings to, to keep you going? Yeah. And like, did, did you set out with... I had with... debt, actually. Oh, wow. Well, what... <laughs> <laughs> how, how long was it until you thought this is a viable option i'm starting to make a bit of money here and this was a good decision and wh- when you left your your job where you were deeply unhappy were you immediately happy again when you started getting all this new stress from the agency well it wasn't stress at first because there was nothing to do i remember the first when i first started i never run a business i didn't know anything i just had jobs i remember rented a desk next to my mate at a co-working i was like cool this is it this is being an entrepreneur here we go <laughs> and then i'd be like cool but what do i do and i'd be like i'd send like my cold outreach for the week and then i'd be like right now what and it, well there's nothing there's no admin there's no, no one's paying me anything i've got nothing to i just didn't know what to do so it wasn't stressful at all then it was really exciting and i just spent all my time thinking and listening to shows and reading books and getting excited about everything probably wasn't until about two years in that I started to resemble a wage that I could live off. It wasn't matching my previous wage, but it was a thing. Yeah. And then it was kind of the three year mark where I was matching my wage. And and then subsequently, we've, we obviously managed to exceed that. But, you know, it is not a get rich quick scheme by any means. Do, do you ever want to start new things? Constantly. It's a daily battle. You know, everyone has shiny object syndrome, right? And I've got endless lists of things that I want to do and some of them I think are pretty good ideas but I just I know that every time I even dip my toe in investigating one I'm like the main business is working focus on that get it to a point before you start doing the next thing you know I want to start a software business as next as, as, as much as the next person but I know that's going to take a huge amount of energy and so I need to wait until I'm able to give it that. I, I think it's almost a talent being able to not pursue shiny objects. You know me, I'm starting all <laughs> things all the time. Um, but you're also at the stage where it's earlier, <laughs> yeah, right? Like yeah. you're earlier in the journey and so everything is smaller. And so it's 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 much easier to get distracted by these other things because you don't know yet what's going to grip, what's going to work. And so I think you're at the perfect stage to just throw a shit ton of spaghetti at the wall, see which thing sticks and then really go at that one hard. There's lots of people that have strong positions on 
being focused or having a portfolio of things. And I think it's basically bullshit. You just got to do things that you're good at and enjoy, see which ones work. And then when it makes sense to focus, then great, do a period of focus. But yeah, I mean, I'm jealous because it looks fun. I want to be making courses and doing a ton of different things and all this stuff. Honestly, this is the most fun I've had in the past 18 months when I'm just trying a bunch of things and not worried about if they work or not. Now, Harry, you at Lower Street make some really shit hot podcasts. I love listening to your podcast. When I was producing some for a client, I came straight to you and I said, Harry, what podcasts have you produced? I'm going to listen to them for inspiration. Oh, but thanks, what is the process for coming up with a good podcast idea and then executing it really well? And there are there any opportunities for people to make podcasts that haven't been made before? Yeah, for sure. The most important thing is thinking about the the listener and not thinking about you, the podcaster. I think it's really tempting to go, I've got this great idea for a show. I'm going to talk to these people about these things and it's going to be wonderful for this reason. But what you're not thinking about is actually, is there anyone out there that cares and wants to listen to that? Because then what we're finding is that you're making a show and then you have to go into the world and do everything you can on social media to try and convince people to listen to the show. But what you're trying to do is sell a thing that you think they might want instead of, you know, a la Rob Fitz Fitzpatrick. Like, what do they actually mm -hmm. want? Let's work backwards from that and try and make it. So that's the biggest thing, I think, for a lot of people is just like really trying to understand who you're trying to serve and why. And then let's look at what they're already listening to, figuring out how do we differentiate from those things that are already out there and how do we make something that's better and unique in our own. The short answer is to, to the second question is just making something that is better. I, again, I don't want to say it's not hard because it is hard, but the point is the bar is not super high. Most every show in most every <laughs> niche that you're probably talking from a business perspective is it going to be an interview based show and it's probably going to be 45 minutes to an hour. Uh, and it's probably just going to be two white dudes <laughs> talking to each other and then lightly edited and pushed out. And that's great. And it might be recorded on Zoom. And it might sound like crap. And that's fine. But what you have the opportunity to do is something better. And so what that looks like for us, for the most part, is just really rigorously planning that episode, thinking about the structure, not just the questions that you want to ask, but what's the beginning, middle and end. And I love the Notion doc you sent to me ahead of time. You're really thinking about not just the questions, but what order and how's, what's the narrative you're trying to spin here. So thinking about that in advance before you sit down with the person, you want to be in a position where you know like 80% of the answers to the questions that they're, they're going to give you because you've planned so meticulously. But at the same time, you don't want questions that mm -hmm. if you could Google the answer, you could Google the answer. You want to be answering, asking good things. And then you want to be doing things like narration and stuff to help you with that editing process. So you can take an hour's worth of material and bring it to a sub 30 minute episode by using narration. The narration's purpose is to fill in the blanks from the stuff that you cut out, right? And, and I think just doing that, saving the listener half an hour of their life, using narration so that you're really engaging them and they're really listening to you and your opinion and you're asserting your thought leadership in, in this kind of topic and just caring about the process in general will elevate your show massively and you um when, when lockdown happened and you were looking for different ideas what what do we do now we've lost 30 percent of revenue one thing you did which i absolutely loved and i still go back and listen to this is you did mm. your daily podcast work from home daily what, what did you learn from doing a daily podcast and how, how come you had to stop that I learned that consistency is really fucking hard. <laughs> yes, it is. It's really hard. And it's really hard to make something of high quality too. So we were trying, obviously we're an agency, right? We want to be like showing off. And what you find is like on a Thursday and you're trying to find that next story for the next day. And you're also trying to just churn stuff out. And you're like, well, we can't churn stuff out. We're trying not to churn. Do you think consistency or quality is more important? You can go for the cop-out answer and say both. But well, what I say to clients is that if you can't do quality consistently, you should do quality for a limited period. So a 12 part season, let's say. I don't know if one's more important than the other. I think consistency will teach you so much about the craft of podcasting and you will inevitably gain that audience over time. So probably consistency is most important, mm -hmm. but but I'm obviously a, a proponent of quality. And I think that it's all too easy to jump on and just go, cool, I'm doing podcasting. I'm doing a straightforward interview show. There's much more to it than that. And, and, and I think people should invest a bit more of their time and energy into it. I think that's a wonderful bit of advice there. Um, there's one final thing. I know we've run over our slot that I wanted to ask you about, okay. that I've never actually asked you about, which is your mountain bike community um, thing that you did. Absolutely. We're still doing it. So it's called singletrackconf.com is my little plug. And it is a founder's retreat for mountain biking. It's a, a small gathering, 12 people, all entrepreneurs, online entrepreneurs getting together to, to hang out for three days. I find those sort of really small scale focused events to be an amazing way to network, get to know each other's businesses. If there's more than 12 people, you can't really get to know yeah. each other and really focus on each other's businesses. The amount you can learn in those periods is incredible. And I think it also benefits from having just like a focus that you can all 
gather around and for me that's a love of mountain biking how much work is it to set up everything not a lot to be honest basically the hard work is getting interesting people so if you can get 12 interesting people all you got to do is book an airbnb find somewhere you can rent bike well one thing i will say is the activity mountain biking is inherently slightly dangerous <laughs> and one uh, my friend thomas love did actually uh break a rib on day three no. of, the, of, of our inaugural event oh. that was pretty fun so we spent a few hours in in andorran a and e so yeah watch out for that but it was it was awesome so I, I highly recommend set up your own event if you're into i don't know wine just go and find a, a winery with an airbnb on it and get a group of people together to talk about business because i think it's a, a really great way to spend time Harry, we end every episode on three recommendations, a book, a podcast, and an indie hacker. Can you give me your recommendations? The first one is Out on the Wire. It's all about basically narrative storytelling for podcasts, all centered around Radio Lab and This American Life, and it's a graphic novel as well, so that's always fun. Wow. Podcasts, um, the one that got me into podcasting and starting a business was the first season of Startup mm-hmm. from Gimlet as well, so I'd have to recommend that. I think the person that I'm most respecting of or that I look up to a lot is Andrew Wilkinson, which I'm sure is like pretty common among uh, groups around here. I don't have the ambition to, to have a $1 billion publicly traded uh, company, but I just really love his approach to portfolio businesses it's definitely what i aspire to in the long run well harry thank you so much for joining this episode of indie bites thanks for having me mate. really fun to talk thank you for listening to this episode of indie bites with harry morton as always everything discussed in the episode including links to find out more will be in the show notes or at bites.fm a quick reminder that you can pick up my course two hour podcast for the launch price with ten dollars off using the code bites at checkout also the membership for indie feast is still going strong where you can get extended and ad free episodes head to bites.fm slash membership for that see you next week <laughs>